All right, so this is uh, this week's JHR Threads uh, with Jan Marcus, and, um, and we're going to be discussing his paper with Vishali Zamber, The Effect of Increasing Education Efficiency on University Enrollment. Jan, I was wondering if you could just start out and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from and, and where you work. Where are you right now? Yeah. Hi, my, my name is Jan. I'm an assistant professor at the university in Hamburg, but right now I'm in Berlin where I live. And what you can see in the background, that's my, <laughs> my, home, my home office. This is a great paper. I'm really looking, I'm really excited to talk about it and help other people sort of learn about it. Um, so I, I wanted to start out, uh, I had some questions here. I think a lot of people, you know, in the United States, they really only know about uh, our first through 12th grade kind of progress through school and they really don't know how it works in Germany. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what schooling was like for the typical student before 2007. Yeah, so in order to enter a university in Germany, usually you were required to do 13 years of school. I uh, meaning four years of joint primary schooling. After primary schooling, students are tracked according to ability, and so at the age of about 10, so quite early. Mm -hmm. And uh, most students that go to the academic track, which is kind of the, the highest track, uh, they are prepared to enter university. Uh, after uh, nine years of, of secondary schooling, meaning after uh, 13 years in, in total. So can you tell us exactly what uh, was the the change that the G8 reform did to these students? The G8 reform consists of two parts. The first part is the elimination of the last year in school. And the second part is um, an increase in weekly instruction time in the remaining school years in order to compensate for the elimination of the last year uh, in school. So in sum, before and after the reform, affected students had the same amount of instruction time across their, their school career. Uh, after the reform, however, it was distributed uh, among fewer years of school. So there's this really beautiful uh, picture that you have in the paper uh, called an event study graph. And, uh, you know, one of the things that really jumps out is, it, is this, these little dots before the intervention and they're all on the horizontal line and I was wondering if you could sort of tell us why did you do that and what are we what are we learning from that so a, a crucial assumption in our difference and difference approach is that our outcome variables share the same trend uh, in the absence of the reform of course we, we don't know how the outcome variables would look like if there was no reform but kind of the assumptions that they, they follow the same trend as the uh, untreated states. And this assumption seems mu much more plausible if the, the variables have the same trend before the reform. And these little dots that we show there is kind of the, the difference um, in between treatment and control states and the differences um, between treatment and control states. And so that, that shows that before the reform, treated and untreated states had a very similar trend in their outcome variables. And this makes it more plausible that the trend will be the same after the reform if there was no reform. So uh, I was wondering if you could sort of tell us a little bit about what you find. You have three main outcomes that, you, that you're looking at. And I was wondering, could you tell us, you know, in summary, what did you find and, and how really, how big, how important are these effects? Are they big or are they just, you know, are they small? So we, we looked at three different outcome variables. The first is, do students enroll at all? The second relates to, to the timing of enrollment. Now, do they immediately enroll to university or do they kind of spend some time in between? And the third one relates to uh, the regular study program, uh, meaning once they, they are enrolled. With respect to the first outcome variables, yeah, we find that about six percentage points fewer of students actually enroll in university. And this is a massive effect. Now, when, when you look at the, the effect that tuition fees have, uh, there's kind of a consensus estimate that, that a, a raise in tuition fees of about like $1,000 kind of decreases enrollment rates by two to four percentage points. 
And so the effect that we find here is twice as large as that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not because the, the suddenly university uh, studies is costly, it's just because of the reform. So wait, um, you're saying if you were to raise tuition $1,000, you would find this reduction in enrollment, and your finding is that it's actually twice as big as that number. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Okay, sorry, keep going. So that, that was the first outcome relating to, to the second outcome, the timing of enrollment. We see that actually students take a bit longer to enroll. There are fewer students who immediately enroll after high school graduation. More students kind of take off a year, you know, like a gap year. Uh, they they're might be traveling or doing kind of internships, uh, but it takes them a bit longer to enroll. However, the majority of students is still much younger uh, when they enroll at university. With respect to the third outcome, the regular study progress, we find that more students drop out due to the reform, about one percentage point. And so that, that's much smaller than the six percentage point on general enrollment, but, but still uh, non-legible. Uh, um, and we also find that uh, students are more likely to switch their major. Yeah, yeah, this is very, this, the, you know, I was, when I first read the paper, when I was first reading it, I was really excited at the prospect that with these little tweaks, you might be able to have these big, nice effects. And I was really discouraged, uh, you know, to learn it wasn't that easy. Uh, it made me think, um, we always in economics talk about these free lunches and we can't have them. And I guess that's what we're learning from your paper is that we're, we're not getting these free lunches. Yeah, no, that, that, that's completely right. And we, we were also disappointed uh, in the sense that we kind of thought more the effect would go towards zero uh, in the sense that, I mean, why, I mean, they had the same amount of instruction time across their school career. And uh, so there's, why is the effect on general enrollment rate still so massive? Uh, but it, it right. seems that it's not so easy to kind of just increase the learning day uh, that, that you have that kind of many people are more, more tired after some time and cannot cope with the additional material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems so obvious, but it was not at all obvious to me when I first started reading it. But when I saw your discussion, I, it, that seemed so plainly clear that could happen. I, I, you know, you have this discussion, you call it mechanisms, and I was wondering, you know, why do you think you're finding these things? What, what exactly is behaviorally happening, and how do you prove that? Something's going on on the demand side, and that could be because the students are younger by one year, or it could be because the increased workload that the students have, and that they could not really cope with that. Right. Um, uh, so it might be that our effect is basically driven just by the younger age of the student. Right. Um, so, so we rather believe that much of the effect is going through what we call the workload channel, mm. uh, that the students in, in high school or in, in this academic track school were not able to kind of fully cope with the uh, additional instruction time. And uh, we, we find that their grades in high school worsened, so we're confirming previous literature. Um, we, we see that more of them took, took a private tutor and um, that um, yeah, generally it might also be that they're less happy uh, with the university and, and with, sorry, not with, that they're less happy with learning uh, yeah. because they have so much stress in high school. And uh, so they might decide not to go on learning because it was too, too stressful. It's a very compassionate study. I, I was really, you know, I think a lot of people think of economics as the dismal science, but this was really, really not like that. It was a study of, you know, how to help these children uh, as well as the country. And, you know, you, you gained this unique insight that they were being stressed out. They were, they, the workload was really, really hard for them. I thought that was really yeah. interesting. Yeah, thanks. We, we were also kind of hoping that kind of Germany or the German states developed a method how to get around this trade-off between earlier labor market and uh, constant levels of education. But yeah, as the results show, it does not come without cost.
Yes, there's only so many hours in the day for you to work. And they, they cannot, you, you cannot pay full attention the, the whole day. Yeah, right. So. right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me about this study. I, I hope that, um, uh, I hope everybody gets a chance to read it. I thought it was brilliant and really well done and uh, really valuable. So I just wanted to say thank you for talking to me. Thanks very much, Scott, for, for setting this up and for giving me the opportunity to, to present uh, the results here. Thank you very much.